Welcome to The Disruption Is Now. Join us on this enlightening journey as we explore how AI is impacting our jobs, careers, lives, and the human experience. Each episode, host Greg Matusky will converse with visionaries and innovators at the forefront of AI, diving into its challenges, opportunities, and impact. So buckle up as we venture into the heart of disruption, and together, let's unfold the future. Welcome to The Disruption Is Now, the podcast about all things AI. I'm your host, Greg Matusky. I'm the CEO and founder of Gregory FCA, one of the country's largest public relations agencies. We're kicking off our podcast series live from Voice in AI here in Washington, D.C. So stay tuned as we bring you some of the thought leaders and movers and shakers in the world of generative and conversational AI. Welcome to another episode of The Disruption Is Now, the podcast where we talk about everything AI. It is an anomaly of sorts today. We're out of the studio. We're here at the Voice and AI Conference in Washington, D.C. It's an exciting day. We have some great keynote speakers here today, and we have some great guests coming at you. We're going to do a series of podcasts. I am Greg Matusky. I am the founder and CEO of Gregory FCA. We're one of the largest public relations agencies in the United States, and we have a real love of AI. We're early adopters and evangelists of the technology as we implemented our business, and we work to, with other companies to learn what they're doing and uh, how uh, we might know more about artificial intelligence, how it's effect affecting the global economy. I'm here today with Ian Collins. He's CEO of Wisdom AI, and they're working to overcome some of the inherent problems in chatbots. You know, we all love and hate them. On the one hand, we're aware of the chatbot for OpenAI, and we love what it does. It's great for parlor tricks, making haikus, and love uh, love songs for our significant others on Valentine's Day, but then when we interface with companies online with their chatbots, it often purposely seems like gives you the wrong answer just to infuriate and get you off the phone, but it's not on purpose. It's all because of errors and expectations and in communication. So Ian, thanks for being with us. Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, you kind of got it right, Greg. You know, we work with larger organizations that have millions of conversations. You know, their customers are having millions of conversations with their chatbots. They purchase a chatbot from, you know, Microsoft or Google or Amazon or, or a Salesforce, and they're wondering, did it go well? Did they take care of their customers? You know, did they solve the customer's problem? Did the customer walk away with a gr having a good experience with that bot? So we help them analyze millions of conversations to understand those key metrics, you know, was it effective, did it solve customer problems, and what do they need to do to actually make it better? But that's, but, a, that's tough, look, I'm yeah. a communications professional, and that's yeah. what I do is try to, uh, try to smooth understanding, try to extend understanding. Right. That sounds to me like a pretty complicated process because, because what you think you're asking or answering yeah. can, might not be the real question. And yeah. we see this in prompt writing, yeah. right? People come back to me and say, oh, generative AI is no good. It didn't give me what I wanted. And yeah. I'm, yeah. I you always- You asked the wrong question. Right, I always yeah. come back to, how did you prompt it? And they can be yeah. too general. They can be something, for instance, I never saw or yeah. coming, right? They yeah. Could, yeah. And, and we've come up with these pillars of writing great for content, writing mm -hmm. great prompts. There's mm -hmm. five of those pillars based on my experience in writing. Mm -hmm. But that seems to me to be such a chasm. How does that work in big organizations and enterprises? Yeah, so you're right. That is kind of the core of the problem. When you create a chatbot, you imagine what the customer might say and what your response might be and expect you might solve that customer's problem. But you always get it wrong. And that's, I think, why we see so many terrible chatbots. Um, you can't really guess. So this is where the analytics come in and what we do as a business. We look at it after you've already launched your bot. So you went through and you bought something from Google, for example, you put it all together, you guess what the customers are going to say, and you tried it and you launched it, and then you're going to wonder, how does it doing? Exactly, did it solve the customer's problem? Did the customer actually enjoy the experience? Or did they hate it? Did they, you know, how often did they have to talk to a live agent? So there's sort of building it in your expectations, and then after the fact, you need to analyze and really understand it. And when there are millions of conversations, you, know, you can't obviously read them one by one. You need an analytics system that's going to tell you. So are you doing that through LLM and natural language processing where I could just probe it 
and, and, and understand where the disconnects are? How not, does it work? Not yet, yeah. So, see, the LLMs are still pretty new in this in the chatbot side of the world. I know, you know, we've got ChatGPT, of course, and they're, it's good for some things, generating content and things, but in the enterprise world, you know, our clients are banks and insurance companies and, you know, telcos and stuff. They need to be absolutely certain that the customer gets the right answer. So in the LLM world, unfortunately, it's still a little hard to control exactly the answer a customer is going to get. So they're still mostly focused on Gen 1 bots, you know, classifier-based bots, and we'll use LLMs a little, you know, in the background, but the core of that system is still a Gen 1 classifier, an NLP engine that says, customer said X, I've got a certain confidence they meant this, I match that to an intent, and it often goes down a certain flow you've designed. And then we step in and analyze it, did it actually work? And we'll use some LLMs in that background as well, but the LLM hasn't transferred to the core of it. You know, we say you can enhance your bot with an LLM or you can replace your bot. And replacement isn't ready yet. It's just not, we're not In there. your experience, what percentage of answers from bots are accurate, appropriate, and solve the, the customer's issue? Yeah, this, what is, do you see? this is exactly what we measure. So typically when we find, you know, we meet a new client, and you know, we'll go and measure their bot. And we measure for three things. The, you know, what we call automation, how often you solve the customer's problem, not containment. A lot of people measure containment, but we don't, I don't contain. Know what the, containment. Yeah, contain. I don't know what that means. Yeah, contain just means we kept you away from a live human agent, right? Oh, which would, which would, isn't the goal, yeah. Right. We, we don't want to do that. We want to solve the customer's problem. So we measure that. We measure the customer experience. How do you leave the customer feeling? You know, even if we hand you right to a, a live agent, which some you know, bots will do in certain cases, which is totally fine, we want to make the customer feel good. And third is the cost. Did we do all this at an effective cost? Because everybody in the, in the world of the enterprise will say, my cost per call is you know, 12 bucks, my cost per live chat is seven bucks. And then you need to understand clearly your cost per automated or you know, chatbot case where you've solved the customer's problem. So we measure those three things for the customers and when we first meet you know, many bots, and we first plug in and run the analysis, they're running horrible numbers. They don't realize it because they're measuring something like containment, which is how often did I keep a customer away from a live human agent? And that's really not the goal. What they want to do is solve problems. So we measure how often they're solving problems and it can be as low as 5%. And they had no idea that these bots are so ineffective and the customer experience rates will be down in the, you know, terrible on this, in these metrics. Yeah, that's, that's and the cost is through the roof. So that's, we help them drive those numbers in the right direction. That's interesting in containment. I, I recently had an issue with an employee. And yeah. The employee said, I have never missed a deadline. Yeah. And everybody is happy with my work. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, Really? Yeah. Everybody's happy. That's yeah. I'm hearing some discontent about the the output, right? Yeah. The level, the quickness. That's not the case. Yeah. I did some digging and I found out that people weren't giving this individual a lot of work because they weren't confident they were going to get it back in a timely ma manner, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So So they're hitting their metrics. Right. So yeah. that's containment, right? Yeah. It didn't go yeah. It, it, it wasn't outside the walls. Exactly, right? they're measuring the wrong thing. Right, right. 100%, and, and, and we see the exact same thing in this chatbot world. People are measuring the wrong things. They don't really understand the, you know, the, the actual reason they built this thing was to solve customer problems, not to contain. You know, this containment idea is a terrible idea, and the whole industry's been stuck on this metric, because it's very easy to measure. Measuring you know, how often you solve the customer's problem is quite difficult. It needs an analytic system, you got to dig in, use another kind of AI, we use this conversation analysis and topic modeling to other AI techniques to, to look at the stream of words between the customer and the bot and the customer and the live agent. If you look at that whole stream of words back and forth and apply AI to that, you get a very clear picture. Did you solve the customer's problem? What the customer experience was, and so then you can use. So, where is this all going? Cons. Are we going to just be bots talking to each other someday? That my refrigerator yeah. will have an issue, <laughs> well, and it will. It's a good question. You know, where are we go in this the whole co-pilot world is coming along. You know, today, like most technologies, we see it begin in the enterprise. You know, these companies, you know, hundreds of billions in revenue and stuff. They can go out and spend millions of dollars on a bot program and and experiment and make these things work. And then it works down market, right? You get the mid market, you get the SMB market, and eventually, you and I personally, we'll have our own bots. Uh, you know, might be 10 years away, but you know, everybody's talking about this personal co-pilot, and it's going to help us with our work, with school, with learning, with you know, whatever we do in life. So, I believe it is coming. Like, all big tech waves, they start in the enterprise, you know, the biggest organizations, and eventually end up in consumer. Well, and I think we're going to be, be there. a digital twin. I'd love to have a digital twin today, because yeah. as we're doing our podcast today, there's keynotes, speaks, uh, <laughs> speakers. Uh, speakers. Yeah. 
going on. They're very interesting. I can't be there, but this It could be in there summarizing right, for you, right, telling you what you really, right. it would know you and what you want to hear. Right. Like I say, most of these, you know, you hear people speak and 10, 90%, you're like, probably not for me, but 10% is that interesting stuff. Right. And a bot that really understands you well is going to say, here's the 10%, Greg, that you need to listen to. Yeah, that'd be uh, really helpful today. There's yeah. so much great stuff happening here yeah. at Voice and AI. Yeah. Ian, I want to thank you for being with us. It's Ian Collins. He's CEO of Wisdom AI, and they're working on this whole issue uh, bots, chat bots, and how they can become more effective using artificial intelligence and other parameters. So, thanks for being with us. And great uh, to be here. Good luck. It was great meeting you. Great meeting you too. Thanks, Take Greg. Take care. All right. Hey, we're continuing our series here from the floor of uh, Voice and AI, and uh, somebody who's close to my heart because he's a professor. <laughs> at Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Pennsylvania, which I was a communications major yes, you at were. the University of Pennsylvania. I checked, it's true. It's true, and I graduated with honors, I might add. That's pretty good. Joe Honors, he sat four rows ahead <laughs> yes, of me. That's right. And, um, but it is Joe Toro, professor of, of communications. Yes. And he's writing a book on AI and marketing, I understand. Trying to, yes. So tell me a little bit about what brings you to voice and AI what you hope to learn as a professor and how you, how you stay current in the well, world that's we're in. Well, I, um, I actually went to a motive conference about uh, five years ago when I was writing the other book. And uh, my other book is called The Voice Catchers, which is really about the, the social implications of voice. Um, and so now I'm more and more interested in AI generative as well as predictive AI, data analytic AI. And when I saw this conference, I said, gee, maybe he'll let me in. <laughs> so he let me in. And I'm here, and I'm learning a heck of a lot. It's terrific. So tell me a little bit about the conflict within the academic community and what generative AI brings to the party. Or This is it. totally new. I mean, within the last year, we've had this issue, and it's come up a number of times. Uh, I was teaching a small seminar last year. And just out of curiosity, I said to my students, how many people use ChatGPT? This is right after it came out. Everybody in the class raised their hand. Already. It's amazing. All... So I said, do you use it to write essays? They said, no, we use it to fix up stuff, that, to give us stuff, and then we fix it up, and then we write. But it's clear the students are using it. I mean, and, and I'm, one, I'm, I'm a person who doesn't think that we can shut it off. It's not like you can tell people, never look at this stuff, never use it. They're going to do it. They're the going to do it. The real issue is uh, they should be transparent about it, and they should make sure that they're not using hallucinations, which happens a lot. Yeah, yeah. and we're seeing the same thing in the workforce. Uh, when people are surveyed, they say, oh, we only use it limited. But when they're really studied behaviorally, mm -hmm. they use it for a lot more. because It can be addictive. Yeah, it can be addictive, and it can be very safe, right? Mm -hmm. Like in brainstorming. Yeah. If you do brainstorming, you go into a session, the first thing people say is, um, well, this might be a crazy idea, because uh, they're, they're right. insecure. Yes. Or they might not give the crazy idea that you need. Brainstorming on, uh, on generative AI, it's a safe place to really explore a lot of things. And you can get a lot of good ideas yeah. out of it. And that becomes very addictive, I find. It's, in a, the it's an interesting question. And, and I've been wondering, and people like you tell me, I don't have to worry about this worry in quotes, whether real creativity can come out of this. Because if it's really basing itself on everything else that people did, particularly if you're feeding the documents, how creative can it really be? I believe it can be, and from my personal experience, yeah. it can be very creative. I'll give you an example. I represent one of the leading uh, behavioral health centers in America. Mm -hmm. They uh, provide uh, substance abuse recovery services. And I ask it to come up with a, uh, a, a uh, word, a term, for what they do. And it needed to be alliterative. Not alliterative, it needed to be when you take the first word of each uh, letter and it means something. Yeah. What's that called? Um, I know what you mean, but I don't remember. And and so I played around with it, and it came up with it's this. It's not a cross stick, is it? No, it's. Okay. Um, oh, geez, this is making a bad we'll podcast because I can't think of the of right. the term for when 
Like, Call us in. Yeah, IBM is international business machine. But anyway, oh, an acronym. An acronym. Jeez. Yeah, I thought I'm it was more complicated. Than I that. must have gone to Penn and not. Uh, yeah. And not. Uh, so, uh, you done well for you. Harvard. So, um, and it came up with self, and it had a term that was applicable to each of the services. Wow. And I prompted it to do that. And then I made it, I asked it to give me a series of social media posts about self. And the resulting work product was just beautiful. Hmm. I'll give you another example. I asked it to take two disparate ideas. And this is interesting because early on, I tested chat GPT. You know, it's all, it's all algorithms and it's sure. associative words. Yeah. But I wanted to see if it could come up with disassociated words. And I asked it to take the um, the, uh, the, ge the divergent disassociative test. You give it four minutes, and you come up with 10 words that do not often appear together. Wow. And that's supposed to be a test of creativity. Yeah. The machine, and it would take tests back then, it doesn't anymore. The machine scored 86, the average human scores 72 on that test. That's impressive. It could come up with words that do not connect. You know, and you know, as it gradually gets harder because the tenth word mm -hmm. can't be associated yeah. with the first word. Yeah. And so my I believe that it's very creative. And think for instance, before I do a sales call, I'll ask it to give me all the objections that what am I missing here? That's impressive. And it'll feed me Now is that based on data you feed it or the general chat GPT for training set well for instance I had a I had a uh, committee meeting coming up right it was kind of a high-risk committee meeting and uh, it was all agency heads mm -hmm. and I wrote a prompt that basically said that that I had this committee meeting I don't want to be overly aggressive mm -hmm. I want to be inclusive I want to hear their ideas but I also want to assert my own opinions. This was about AI. Yeah. And it gave me a whole list. Uh, be careful, you may say things that uh, another person, an expert would know are not true. Uh, be careful, you may come off as being, uh, not being inclusive because your opinions trump others. Very interesting. And it prepped me for that call. So it, it's all how you th invert your thinking sometimes and use it on that creative balance. Well, and so I, I think students are beginning to realize that themselves and they're beginning to use chat. We're gonna have to figure out in the university what does it mean? Like for example, if, a, if an English professor gives an essay about the Scarlet Letter, how should your essay be different now knowing that students can use chat? Of course, students always knew that they could go to Monarch Notes or Cliff Notes. But this is like a step beyond it. And uh, I know that people have begun to put caveats on their syllabi, saying that if you're going to use this, you better be careful and clear about it. Um, it'll be very interesting to see down the line how this changes education. It's, it's not clear now what's going to happen. But I think it's a profound change in the way students have access to knowledge. I do too. And I think the biggest, one of the biggest differences, the transformation is it gives you that knowledge in a conceptualized fashion. Mm -hmm. Like you could gain by going to Google information about the Scarlet yes. Letter, right? But when you see it in a narrative, it's so much more memorable and powerful. Yeah. We'll use it a lot of times, for instance, we'll have tech clients, we won't really understand what they're doing and we'll use it to become instant experts mm -hmm. and it'll contextualize the findings on very technical issues that you would never think it would have some sort of uh, I don't that's in. I don't understand the training set what I have tried to figure out is whether it tracks for example trade magazines and I haven't been able to figure out that it does I asked it to give me an example of um, of marketers that combine uh, generative AI with predictive AI. And it came out with a whole very interesting set of, of examples, uh, one of which I tried to track down through Google, and I couldn't. So I said, could you tell me where you got this information? And it gave me deep apologies. It said, oh, I apologize, this is not necessarily true. And then um, I said, can you tell me any citations for where you get your data? 
and it said, oh, I apologize, I can't do this. I have been told by people here that it's a mistake to try to get facts out of chat GPT-4. There are other <laughs> programs, uh, AI, generative AI, that will tell you, for example, where they get their data. I found that their data are based, they'll give you stuff like McKinsey reports, they'll cite that. Uh, but I can't figure out where it gets the kind of information you're talking about. I, I, what their training set in is remarkable to me. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I wouldn't use it as a research tool. And here's, I, I saw a recent blog post that said, um, don't use uh, generative AI as a thesaurus, hmm. right? There are th th thesauruses. Thesauri, yeah. and, and I say, don't use it as a research tool because there are research tools. That could be Google, that could be Bing, which does give right. you citations. But, but implicitly, it is when it gives you these summaries, it's still doing research. You know, and it's telling, the advice that it's giving you, which presumably is very good advice, comes from somewhere. Well, I think what we're seeing is a copy of a copy of a copy, right? If you take a photocopy and you copy, yeah. copy, copy, it degenerates. Yeah. And it starts to fill in. A Xerox machine will start to fill in missing information yeah. that it's just short of. So what it does when it doesn't know it, I'll give you an example. Um, early on, I did, a, uh, I did a search on Silicon Valley Bank. Right. Well, it's it has a blind eye back to October 2021. Right. So it gave me a Wikipedia definition, yeah. and then I said, "Tell me about the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank," and it gave me an explanation. And it said it collapsed due to bad loans. Mm -hmm. Now, in 99% of bank collapses, that's the case. Mm -hmm. So the algorithm was right, but the problem was this was a unicorn event. Right. It was based on how it hedged. It's, exactly. It, you're right. Yeah. How it hedged its bond portfolio, so it was wrong, and it but it presented it in <laughs> such affirmative language that, that you would have believed it. Oh my yeah. God! The first pass, Joe. I thought it was, I I thought right. it was brilliant. And you can try to understand what it meant by bad loans and sort of figure that maybe that was somewhat accurate, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, it's. But so what do you do with that kind of thing? And those, it's giving you summaries and suggestions to some extent based on correlating those data and I don't know if it's factually incorrect. Somehow it comes up with good suggestions I, I, based I would, on. I would hasten you to review it the way you do an academic paper uh -huh. and say, oh, the statistical model is off here. It's wrong with that, kind, the, that degree of skepticism. That's, that would be right. My, but, yeah. Hey, it's been great having you Thank on you today. Very much. Uh, we have much in common. We're both yes, from Philadelphia. We, we both work out at the same gym. <laughs> That's right. We're both associated with the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. So, and we're both here at Voice of AI. It's a pleasure talking with yeah, you. Thank for sure. you. Thank you for your Bye. time, Professor. Sure. Well, we're back with our third uh, episode of the day from the Voice and AI conference here in Washington, D.C. And finally, I get a cool, cool, cool guest after having uh, all the tech guys who went on and on about voice and chatbots and everything happening in call centers, I'm now with, with Chad Gerber. He is the founder of Mellowscene, and he's got quite the story to tell. He's a musician who has come up with an absolutely phenomenal idea to help, help musicians monetize more of what they do. So is that right, Chad? Yeah, it's, it's tapping into several layers of monetization for artists and musicians. Um, so give us the yeah. give us the big the big thirty thousand dollar thirty thousand foot view of what Mellow Scene's doing. Mello I know I know your wife's the brains of the operation. But yeah she handled I I am the I come up with all the insane things and I, then she makes it uh, <laughs> she's the one that gets the people to write the checks and do all that fun stuff. Um, it's essentially the easiest way to explain it is that if you want to go, like, let's say, inside of Abbey Road Studios, and you're over there, and I'm in Los Angeles or whatever, we all go into the space together, and we're all in that virtual studio, and we can make real music, lossless audio together, and we can also bring in fans and let them experience it as well. So what it does is allows for monetization on different levels of, of artistry. So if you're a singer-songwriter, you could perform to your audience in the space, but if you're a producer who's a recluse and hasn't seen the sun in 10 years, they can come in and be a part of the production was process. Was this a product of the pandemic, or was this something that you had been contemplating? And A little bit of both. So it was something I was contemplating for a long time, and I wasn't going to do it until 2025. I don't remember why I picked that date. But 
when the pandemic hit, I was in a meeting with Gibson Guitars as a Gibson artist, and I was suggesting some other like MIDI tech that I want to work with them on. And I mentioned this thing, and they're like, well, we're really interested in what that is. So I was like, well, let me get back to you on it. And then just kind of snowballed and patents were filed and then uh, prototypes were built. Uh, now let me dig yeah. into this more because it's really interesting to me. You were a, mu a successful musician. Yeah, and I still am. Okay. But this a is a future. A studio musician or a Both. performing artist? All of the above. So I've scored, I've scored television, performed the band's Warped Tour. Give, give us some, give us some names. Uh, what have you scored? And So I scored where? a TV show called Expedition Overland which is like a travel show kind of thing. And that was pretty cool. Underground artist name is Woodrow Gerber. It's more like electronic stuff. Uh, pop EDM stuff. I work a lot with like Sony artists and Warner. Uh, what's the other label? Sony. Okay, so Warner, you're an artist. Someone else. You're a musician. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, they're, not tech, they're not so well known for being technicians or technically oriented. No, there's a huge divide between technology and artists. Like there are, that's oil and water. So you get this idea that you'll come up with a, a virtual recording studio, right? Yeah. So that the parties can all take part in it, yeah. who are band members or producers or mixers exactly. or yeah. whatever. Yeah, if I'm it. using the wrong terms, you no, can you got laugh it. at No, you got it. That's 100%. That's an A-plus right there. And what I'm really excited about, <laughs> then, is bringing in the fans. Because yeah. as we were talking earlier, I just always thought there were a lot of ways that musicians mm -hmm. could monetize what they do with their rabid right. fan base. Yeah. And they yeah. miss these opportunities. So explain yeah. that. So, okay, like one of the problems I had is that as things went to streaming, it was like my fan base is growing. But now it's fragmented. So how do I tour to 13 people in South America and these people? It's impossible. The only way to do it is to, I have to bring them to me somehow. So I was trying to figure out how do I do that, but I was waiting on technology and things to evolve. And then Palmer Lucky invented the Oculus down in Manhattan Beach or something. And that was in 2008. Or something and I, and I was like that's okay we're heading in the right direction now um, so I was kind of waiting for the technology to evolve to the point where I could invent my own device that allows for me to plug in my microphones and guitars and then wirelessly jump into these studios and so that's where it kind of started from like, you know when you're on tour on planes or I had to be in like Europe and Brazil for writing sessions you're away from everyone a lot it was just one of those things where I'm like, everybody else gets to do collaboration and Google Docs and all that. Why don't we get to do it and bring in our fans globally? And so it kind of just was, you know, is, going, is in my head. Now, naive question. Is there latency? Yeah. And is that an issue? I have, I have solved latency using a few different tricks. So we'll get to the full-blown latency being solved down the line. But essentially what I did is I removed your reference point for latency. So like right now there's latency, but our brain, our brain compensates for lost time when it hits your ears. My acoustic waves leaving my mouth, my mouth is delayed, but you don't notice it, just like you don't notice your nose. Your nose is right in front of well, your eyes. a lot of people notice my nose, but go ahead. <laughs> so it's based on that concept first, was like how do I facilitate, people just want to connect and be together, and what will they put up with? How much can we put up with? And so I started from that of like, well, if you're on a cell phone, you don't notice the latency which is, you know, we're talking across the planet and there's a bunch of latency, but you don't have a reference point. If you're on the phone in person, you hear that echo. That's latency, that's you hearing, you know, it travel around. So it started with that, and then I had to build out the technology in a way that just allocates file management and audio in a clever way. Uh, and essentially it uses a lot of properties of like gaming. So if you're playing a video game online and you're sniping somebody, these are like millisecond things. But it's just that the music world is so slow and outdated, it never, it has never tried to combine. That's, so that's brilliant. Created. That's brilliant. And so what I'm interested in is how you created this experience for fans or potentially yeah. could be for fans. Yeah. Because as we were talking about, wouldn't it be cool if you could see the moment that a song was created exactly, yeah. from your favorite yeah. performer? Exactly. Yeah. And that's what we're building out. That's what we're doing right now. So we, we built out the prototypes. We use third party software to show what this is and it's functional. Um, and then we did we did the debut on the BBC with it. Now we're heading into the the now next round. How did round. that come about? How, does the BBC just Man, call you one day? They did. They got an email one day and they're like, "Hey, do you want to show this on the show?" And I was like, uh, "Yeah, that sounds good." And then they were like, "Never mind, we have something else going on." I was like, "Okay." Yeah, well, and then they kind of showed back up that's again. That's the nature of the media, right? Uh, 
so yeah, and they reached out. Welcome to my life. Right. Hey, got great news got for you, Chad. For you. You're Never be mind. On the BBC. Uh, oh, uh, Chad, <laughs> they just canceled. Sorry, Rolling Stones just showed up. Never mind. You set up your whole week for it. Yeah, well, they just canceled. exactly. So I was like, yeah. So I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and then they came back around, and we're like, okay, let's go to London. And and since I'm a Gibson artist, Gibson let me have the the Gibson uh, showroom to myself. So I got to like set up in there. You live a cool life, man. I'm telling you. I mean, look, it's really high highs and really low lows, but. You know, I get bored easily, so it's it's well, the perfect balance, I suppose. You know, you're on the high today, boy. You're, you're doing good, my it's friend. It's all right, man. It's, it's pretty, there's nice people here. Some cool AI stuff coming together I'm excited about. Yeah, uh, I just... Uh, you have you heard meet... anything about uh, AI today? Uh, I have. <laughs> you got you to gotta meet uh, <laughs> the guy that just came off my panel. His name is Sean Austin, and yeah. he had worked for Spotify. Oh, there you go. Okay. And he did the original... Um, I think he did the original uh, genres, Slice and Dice. At one point, there you go. Okay. Yeah. He, at one point, he had the most popular playlist in, in pop well, music. Well, when in you the have world. the power of algorithms, yeah, at your fingertips, you'd so you probably can... throttle him. You'd say, "Look, you, you took, you squeezed all the money out of the business." <laughs> Actually, Spotify is both uh, to thank and to blame for what I'm doing. This is true because they essentially cut all the funds off from everyone. We're not making jack with music. So music has been valued to the point of 0. 0.0003 cents a stream. Whereas in my platform, you can release your music on Spotify, have fun, but you can monetize everything you're doing around the music. Well, maybe you could look for other markets that are being mm -hmm. strangled by right. big tech. Are you, are you saying you want to set up a consulting meeting? <laughs> yeah. Is that every, what we're doing? Yeah. Maybe you could look to PR as we right. get twisted out of the system. Yeah, right. Like, well, yeah. podcasters actually are the ones that I didn't see being excited about it, but they like the idea of coming into the platform and having a live audience. Be a oh, part that's of the, true too. The whole situation. So I didn't see that one until I started doing some podcast interviews and they were like, well, can podcasters come in? Like, well, yeah, totally. That would be interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, you could add some excitement to it. Yeah, like your favorite listeners could, you know, show up and be a part of it. Yeah. Podcast still goes out the same way. Howard Stern could bring in the whack pack. Right. Get, right. get Howard Stern, <laughs> get him back on, like, the relevancy of uh, what's going on. <laughs> yeah, he's a little bit uh, dated. He's not as shocking anymore, by the way. It's pretty no. funny when he's talking now. I'm like, if, I, I'm like, does anybody know what he used to say? Because... It's like I know. He's a totally different person now. I know. It's like it's <laughs> unbelievable. Who did I hear an interview with? He had an interview with recently, and oh my god, he was just fawning over him. And I thought this would be the kind of guy you would have sliced and diced totally. in your earlier career. It's, it's funny what the industry. We all do. mellow. You don't know this yet. I, I'm old. Oh, I'm, way, all, I'm way mellow <laughs> compared to what I used to be. Maybe I don't know. I don't know. Do you have kids yet? I do. Yeah. Okay. Well, that yeah. will mellow you. It's, I think it's having the opposite effect. It's making me more nuts. Yeah, this is true too. I don't know. Yeah, you have to. If you're in music, though, you can't. You cannot be mellow. If you're mellow, then you're, you know, a yeah, jazz like, pianist or something. It's That's part of great, the job but. description. Yeah, yeah. You have to be kind of nuts to jump jump into it. Well, Chad, it's been a great conversation. Yeah, You've been the highlight me. of my afternoon. You've been the highlight of my life. Oh Jesus, That's uh, <laughs> uh, you're gonna start singing. I think uh, we're gonna be pen pals. We might. Uh, yeah, and yeah. you can tell me all the exciting things you're doing, and I'll yeah. tell you how I'm sitting you at my come, desk. You just come along. I'm writing just going to be like, news hey, releases. we're heading uh, over to London. You should come with. Yeah, really. Write you, a news release. Let's there's go. There's nothing you would enjoy more than a 62-year-old guy tagging along to all hey, your Hey, 62-year-old guy's got some good information, so I'll just yeah. suck yeah. it right up. Well, and you're founder of <laughs> Mellow Scene, Yep. and you're really making an opportunity for musicians out there. Man. Which I think is fantastic, and uh, it was a great, great time to spend with you. Appreciate it. Thanks again for having me on. Take care. All right, man. Thank you. We're continuing with our series here at the Floor of Voice and AI, and I'm here with Susan Westwater, and she's a speaker, an author, and a consultant. A lot of her emphasis is on content generation, but particularly in voice marketing. She has a long uh, history and experience working in the ad agency world and kind of knows what we suffer yes. through as a PR agency. So, Susan, thanks for being with us. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you're seeing in AI and how it's impacting voice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think I will say that November of 2022 was an incredible day in that ChatGPT launched, and it was exciting because the whole world, all the conversations changed again. My wedding, the birth of my three kids in October <laughs> 2022 changed my life. Tell, right? tell me how it changed yours. Well, I mean, part of it was is in having to explain the relevancy of AI, we've had to do a lot of education. ChatGPT 
has been an incredible way of showing, yes, it's relevant. Anyone can use it. There's a viable business case. L let's linger on that for a second yeah. because I think it is interesting to me that OpenAI released it to consumers. Yeah. And, you know, when the internet came out, the adoption period, it really was, it was colleges, universities, institutions, uh, businesses, and then consumers. And that really accelerated the adoption. Absolutely. And it really did add the fuel to the fire. And what you saw before that was what? A what slow a, burn? Slow burn. And I was, I, we've done um, some primary research on this and actually even just looking through in the course of writing our second book. Everyone goes through a mindset shift. Like, no, no shade on Rogers Everett's uh, the, the adoption curve. Um, personally, I don't think you should ever call an audience laggards. They don't seem to really respond to that. But regardless of where you are, of an early adopter or what have you, you go through this mindset shift of cynicism where you're like, why would I ever want to do that? And then you're kind of like, oh, let me try it out. Then that's successful. And then they say, well, what else can it do? Before we finally get to a point where we say, how do I live without this? And very much up until then, we were living in very much a cynical world because a lot of the ways to interact and engage with AI in these ways was not either obvious like every time you use grammar you're using ai but right. folks didn't think about it that way chat gpt was sort of this i am unashamedly ai people played with it and the novelty began to get that comfort level i laughingly will call it the fart skill period um smartphones went through it iphone went through it alexa went through it we're now to that point where now it's those questions now became not why would I, but what else can I do with this? This is really cool. I tried it out. I, I had Taylor Swift and Metallica write a mashup. This is cool. How do I use this for my business? And right. that's the shift. I right. think the questions changed. Right. And a lot of that, I, I joked in the beginning, it was a lot of parlor tricks. Right. Yeah. yeah. But those parlor tricks, uh, they were jaw dropping. And what I could never understand is how in the past I had seen generative AI be be uh, syntactically correct mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it was semantically yes meaning was in it. it 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 understood the writing process and that's that's my area of expertise I've, right. I've written all my life I've been a storyteller and and I should have been the most resistant person in the world because I had spent my life right. learning to play the harp and now this machine plays the harp better than I do but when I saw it I said what a gift to the world because I believe all communication should be about advancing understanding. And while there's all kinds of obstacles and risks, that is for the human good, to yes. be able to understand one another better. 100%. And I will say that it isn't like part of the way that we use it, we use it as a tool. As a writer ourselves, um, and my husband and I, as we are writing, we use it as a tool that way. We use it for personas. We use it very much as a way of, um, the way that I've heard it described um, by the head of uh, Google's decision making is, it's taking out the thunking tasks, those tasks that you don't like doing, to help you get along to do the things that are human creative and be the human in the loop. And, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about what are those tasks in writing and more and more I come to the conclusion that it's we're transitioning from the age of information to the age of intelligence. In the age of information, it was about the data, which were the words. Yep. And most of us struggled with the words, right? Yeah. And, and because of that, we didn't have time to really focus on the intelligence. Where's, what is the real message? Right. Where do we want to take this? And I joke with my, with my teammates at Gregory FCA, I will never teach AP style again. I don't have to, right? You don't have to worry when you do your natural language processing prompt. You don't have to worry about whether it's structured right, or whether there's a lead, whether there's a transition, whether you, didn't I use this word two sentences before and is that tedious, right? You can just riff and it'll do that work for you. Yep. Um, I have a, a friend of mine actually gave me a, a major tip for editorial is if you then get to that point where you've riffed and you do want to do editorial, ask it to read, look through it and review it as if you were E.B. White. 
and therefore then it goes through and modifies it and helps give you like one of the best editor you know the originator so right. it's incredible how you can use that tool then to continue to refine now how much of your book is is actually generated? it is Come not on. it is not no because first of all first and foremost part of the reason is because mo a good chunk of this book was written before november of 2022 um thank you production publishing process number two there is one thing that comes into play is if something is solely generated by a machine it's not copyrightable so it has to be your original words your original thoughts so that's part of the reason also why we will not just cut and paste um, anything in that from that pers particular perspective is because of that copyright law um, right. when it's something that we want to keep near and dear to our heart right. our, I don't think our publisher would appreciate if we had done that yeah, so, yeah. it's true I mean it's evolving so quickly we mm -hmm. we in our contracts we include information about yep. we disclose the fact that we use uh, chat GPT and generative yep. AI um, and we disclose the fact that, hey, uh, anything that is generated by machine can't be copyrighted, so we have to work together to yes. identify what needs to be copyrighted. Yep. And uh, then we need to document that and hold on to the prov provence, is that the right word? Provenance, yes. yeah, yeah. Provenance, mm -hmm. yep. with regard to how it was constructed, and then we can easily fall within. But a lot of those are red herrings, you know, they're, they're always mm -hmm. thrown out by. I find in my my business, mm -hmm. they're thrown out by people that want to retain their status as experts, right? Oh yeah. And 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 again, I should have been resistant to it because I wanted to be an expert, right? That it's more art than science, and this never could be constructed by a machine. But a lot of it can be constructed. A lot by of a machine. it can be. There are parts of it that can be absolutely. And I think the expertise does come in does come from the humanity of how we interpret and receive it and what you're talking about. Like it doesn't just do these things on its own. And um, we actually, I saw Ethan Mullick speak at the marketing. He's my personal guru. Is he? He is, I, he, we got to see him speak at the uh, marketing AI conference. And he was talking about all of the ways that you can just include it in the loop and putting it within there and that you're coding with your words. That's ultimately what we're doing. And being old enough to have had to learn how to do DOS. For those who don't know Ethan Mollick, yes. he's a Wharton professor who, um, a bit eccentric, he was brought into Wharton to create a, uh, a, a game uh, yep. for MBA students on gaining an MBA. And since he's become a very vocal champion and yeah. uh, evangelist um, of, of generative AI, mm -hmm. I don't know if you see his uh, one... This week is news that one simple idea or one stupid one idea. One simple, use, useful thing. Right, yes. one simple, useful thing. Was, yes. it, I sent it out to the entire firm, and it, and it had a lot of suggestions on how to, how to really use uh, generative AI correctly. And one of the things yeah. is it's not a thesaurus. You know, don't, oh, it, yeah, it, I saw that. Right. And it, and it makes perfect sense, but people want to sometimes diminish it to the level of a grammar check. Or a thesaurus, and it, it's not really that. That's what it. That's yeah. what it's about. Well, and I really geeked out about the way he was talking about how it's just as we learned when we were first learning about how to code and to use things like DOS. A computer will only do what you tell it. So you you know you put in put in a crappy prompt, you're going to get a crappy answer. Yeah. So it is thinking about there's where the art comes into play right. of asking for that. And I also he talked about how. In a way, and, and part of it is because of his gamification mindset. Right. But he talked about how, you know, if you think about the movie War Games and how. Long like, ago. Yes, away, long ago, ahead. but shall we play a game? And oh, I can answer this. I can do this task. I can answer these questions. And those are some of the things where you read some of the reports about where AI has gone off the rails. And it's sort of, we didn't put those parameters and it was trying to win that game. It being. You know, if it was, was it building, unfortunately, building a, a bomb or something like that, it then started to figure it out and how to win and how to do, you know, 20% better than a human. I don't think the question is if it will, if AI will get smarter than humans in some regards. I think it's going to be what happens when AI starts to realize it can develop and optimize to be smarter than a human, not as smart as. How do we navigate and plan for those days? And I and think those it are the really. That keep me up at night. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, and they keep yeah. me up at night too. And sometimes I think, to make it safer, we will have to imbue it with 
the human spirit mm -hmm. and set it free. Yeah. And then I vacillate and I say, no, that's that. If it's if it holds all the traits of humanity, it could be more dangerous. It'll be more flawed than ever. Right. 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 So. I go back and forth on that. And the great part about these conversations is there's no right answer. No. Right? Uh, I listen to all kinds of podcasts, as you must do, mm -hmm. uh, Lex Friedman and others. And oh, yeah. They always end with, could be, could be, yep. would be sending it, could be, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, could be. I mean, part of it, too, is that strong AI, and we haven't dealt with strong AI yet. Luckily, we live in this world of narrow AI, which is helping us sort things out. It's getting really convincing, though, at times, where it can... If you play with it enough, you can start to think it's sunny. You can because because it was made to please us, and it does please us. Oh, it is yeah. because what what we want more than anything, I think, is for somebody to listen to us, mm -hmm. and it listens to us. It listens to us very closely, and because of that, it seems to be that perfect creature who who is yep. listening, is sentient, is mm -hmm. is. It, it, is is associated with you so closely that you could form a bond with yeah no. or it's just pretending to do that so. yeah i mean it's also i like whatever you like right right I mean, and right there are there are pros and cons for that um i think that's also then where the work that uh i scott and i do with the open voice network is very important because the whole vision of that is user um voice assistance worthy of user trust and so it is thinking about the ethics that come into play so that I, I will admit there are times when we were developing early days of web, can we do it instead of should we, was a question that came up more often than not of, can we? Okay, let's try to do the thing. We look back in hindsight, we're like, oh, wait, that was a negative pattern. We shouldn't have been playing that way. We were looking through those things. We're asking those questions now before the horse is too far out of the barn. I mean, it's trying to get through the door. Yeah, for sure. And so that's a helpful thing of that. The ethics question is coming up alongside as opposed to in arrears. Right. And I think that's part of it, too. Right. I agree. I think I think uh, with the Internet, it took us a longer, much longer to realize oh, yeah. the ethical issues. I mean, social media, mm -hmm. I don't even think we've begun to fully understand the full scope of yeah. its ethical issues. And with AI, I think we've been in front of that in, in many, many respects and will continue to be. Hey, this conversation's been great, uh, Susan. I appreciate your time. I think uh, we're kindred souls in some respect. Oh, and for sure. The, some of the things you think about late at night, I think about too. Uh, the, the book, again, is Voice Marketing. It came out in July. and mm -hmm. It's available. How is it available? It's available through Amazon. And well, and if you're at this event, we'll, we'll actually be selling it. But you can also get it directly through Roman and Little, Littlefield and uh, most online booksellers. And you have really good taste because you have... Debbie, Car Debbie yes. Harry on your t-shirt and uh, who doesn't love blondies? So. Exactly. Well, it's proper tech girl wear to wear, you know, your rocker t-shirt with your blazer. I mean, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for being with us. Thank you. This podcast is a production of Gregory FCA. If you enjoyed our discussion today and want to continue exploring the transformative power of AI, please check out more episodes and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.